Hi there once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial. And this is a Python tutorial. It's been a while since I've done one of those, so I thought it was about time I did. And this is another Python effector. And I'm calling this one the Magic Path Effector. And you can see what's going on here as the figure walks across the void. The paving stones are magically appearing and rising up to meet his footsteps. In order to achieve this, we're going to be using a Voronoi fracture on this occasion, as opposed to a cloner, which is a departure that I've never taken before. So that'll make a nice change. I'll also be making use of a spline wrap to achieve this. So it's a combination of a Python effector, a spline wrap and a Voronoi. But anyway, that's what we're going to be about in this tutorial. So without further ado, let's see if we can make this happen. We'll begin by opening up our assets browser here and in the motion capture here we'll bring in the model so we'll just select that bring him into the scene so that's our first element brought in and in the motion capture here we can come down to walking and we want this one the walking loop so we'll bring that in and just drop it into the object list OK, so we've got that sorted out thus far. The next thing to do is assign the actual walking loop to the character. So we'll select that and the source character here. We need to drop the walking loop into there and straight away it snaps into place. And if we play the timeline, we can see that our character is walking on the spot. Well, we don't want that. So all we need to do is drop our character here into the motion offset so we can drop that in there and then he walks fantastic so we've got the, the thing that far let's just see where we are here with the character i'm just going to switch those to invisible so that we can just see the man without the actual rig around him okay great so we've got our first step complete and we can move on to the next step the next thing i'm actually going to do is bring in a tracer and because our character was selected when we brought the tracer in, he's now in the trace link. So that's fine and it's all going to work for us. Now what I'm going to do here is actually measure the distance of one step. So when our character moves from his current position, he's going to take a step and he's going to go to around there. If we switch to our right hand view, I'm just going to hit object so that I can see more clearly what my character is doing yeah that will be fine okay now we can see that the tracer has drawn a spline and we can measure the distance of that spline what we need to do we'll just bring in a, a null object we'll just call it expresso there's no real need to but we will anyway give that expresso null the expresso tag and then all I'm going to do is drop my tracer into here give it an object port at the output stage and then in my general menu here, I can grab a hold of a spline, bring the spline node in, connect the object to the object port, and then give this a length port. And then all we need to do is get a hold of a result node and we can plumb the length into there and we get the length of our step. So that spline that's been left by the tracer is 78.124 or 174 and that's a magic number if we get a hold of our calculator what we're going to do we're going to allow the the man here to take 20 steps so if we multiply 78.174 by 20 we get 1563 we can forget the 0.48 but the important thing is 1563 now that length there or that number there is going to be the length of a spline for our path and that's what we're going to draw next we'll just close the calculator I'll switch to my top view so f2 and get a hold of the spline pen and we'll start playing around with this okay we can draw the spline pretty much anywhere we like so we'll start here and you don't have to be particular about how you draw this however you wish to really um, you know it's it's not an exact science drawing this spline for our path so let's just go somewhere there make it reasonably interesting take this say to over here 
and then come down to say somewhere here just to finish it off. Right, so I'm going to hit the escape key there. And now with my Expresso editor here, I'm simply going to replace the tracer with the spline. And we can see the length of that. Let's just open that up. So it's 1,036. We said we wanted 1,563. So we've got to do some playing around to get it to the correct length. So let's have a look and see what we can do. Just reselect my spline and we can play with the points. So let's get the hold of that one. Just move this out. Let's just bring this in a little bit more so I can see where I am. So we can take this over here. 1114. And it is just a case of, you know, trial and error really just to get it to 1563. That's as much as you have to worry about. You don't need to worry about going any further than that. So as long as it's 1563 that you end up with, you're going to get the right length. And it can be any shape, as I say, that you like. So don't be too particular. Right, we're getting there. So we've got 262. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get this sorted out by the power of editing and then I'll come back to you when I've got it done. OK, and as you can see, I've got it to 1563.569 and that will work perfectly well for us. That's accurate enough. So let's just switch back to our 3D view. So F1, H so that we can see everything and we can we've got our path there and we can now think about making our man walk along the path that's going to be the next step for us the first thing i'm going to do is select the character and give it an align to spline tag and drop our spline in there so okay so that's placed him at the, the start of the path but he's facing in the wrong direction he needs to be turned through 180 degrees well for a start we can check the tangential box that gets us some of the way the next thing we need to worry about though is what's going on with our character's spline here. What we need to do is change the point order for a start. So we're going to reverse the sequence. And that places him facing in the correct direction. But at the moment, he's at the end of the path and we want him at the beginning. We can fix that by using our position here and making this 100%. So what we're going to do is do this we're going to actually reverse down from 100% to zero. That's fine. We've got it that far. Now, we need to work out the timing that we're going to use in order to make him traverse the path. So we know that one step, if we look at our timeline here, we've got it set to 18. That was the length of one step. Now, I want him to take 20 steps in order to complete the path. So. 20 multiplied by 18 is 360. So we can set our timeline to 360 frames. We can record if we set this back to zero. We can record our position at 100% at frame zero and then click through to the end of the timeline, make our position zero and record that there. And now let's play and see what we get. Well, we can see that we've got an issue because at the moment, if we go into our timeline F curve here, we can see that our align to spline is using an ease out, ease in. We want it to be linear. So we can sort that out. So that's the first part of it. Fantastic, so that's working. Now, the next thing we need to worry about is our spline, because at the moment the intermediate points is set to adaptive. It needs to be uniform. And now if we play, we can see that our man is walking perfectly. And his feet are not slipping. He certainly has to twist on the spot in order to keep following the spline. That's got to happen. But when his feet land, you can see that they are rooted. They're definitely not slipping. So that's fine. We've got it that far and everything is working nicely. The next thing we can worry about is building the actual paving stones that we need to rise up to meet his feet as he steps upon them. 
And that's going to be the next thing we're going to be doing. I'll bring in a cube. In the X, I'll make it 50. In the Y, 2. And finally, in our size Z, I will make it 100. Segment Z, I will also make 100. And that gets our cube set up as it needs to be. Moving on from here, I'm going to bring in a spline wrap and drop that into my cube. And the spline that we're interested in will, of course, be our path. So we'll drop that in there. The axis needs to be plus Z. And that's fine. We're all set up. The mode, of course, we're going to leave as fit spline. The end mode I'm going to clamp. From I will leave at 0%, but to I will make 97%. And that just cuts this little piece off. And that's what I want, because if we just make our character walking loop here, we'll just make that invisible. We'll bring our timeline back to zero. And we can see that our character here, if we just move through. So he starts off of the path and his first step here will land him in the center of the first paving stone as we're going to set things up. And the next thing I'm going to do is just make this invisible too. OK, so we can see what's going to happen. But obviously, at the moment, we've just got one single path and we need to split this up into 20 paving stones. And that's what we're going to be doing next with our Voronoi fracture. Right, so let's get a Voronoi. The Voronoi fracture, we'll bring one of those in, drop our cube into it. Now, straight away, we've got to do some work. What we'll do, if we go to our object tab here, for a start, I'm going to offset the fragments by four centimeters. That's as much as I need to do in there. Now, in my sources, I don't want a point generator distribution. What I want is a spline. We'll drop that into there. And straight away, we can see that things have improved. If we just click the spline, the distribution does want to be even. However, the point amount I'd like to make 21. That needs to be just one extra than it is. Now, let's just see what happens when we run the sequence. So things start OK. Ah, but they're not so good there, are they? Not looking so good. Now, why might that be? Well, I know exactly why it is. If we go into our Align to Spline tag here, We've got our last keyframe at 360. Now, although it took 18 frames for each step, the sweet spot is actually not 360. What we need to do is set this keyframe here. We need to set this to 342. 342. That's 342. Four, three. 342. 342. Ha! Ah, I'll get it right in the minute. 342. There we go. So we've got that set to 342. Let's set our timeline the same, 342. And now let's play the sequence and see what happens. And we can see that he's hitting the center of each paving stone correctly. So that's important. I didn't want to show you that earlier because I needed the Voronoi set up before I could actually show you it. But you can see that that's really improved things. And there's still no slippage. His feet are landing and they're working perfectly. So that's what you've got to do. You've got to set this up at 342 frames and make sure that that's working correctly. So that's fine. Everything is working so far. Now, there's a few few more things that we need to do. So if we go, if we go back into our Voronoi fracture here, they'll, the detailing is something that we need to look at. So we'll enable the detailing. And then we can take a look at what we're actually going to do in here. Now, most of this can stay the same. We don't want keep original surface. We'll switch that off. And straight away, we can see that we've got a very, very odd shape going on here. But if we switch to our right hand view, so F3, we can see that we're affecting the actual depth of the objects. The Y scale is what we're affecting here, as well as the X and Z. What we need to do is make this zero. That's fine, because now we have flat stones, which is what we want. 
We've still got some nice irregular shapes going on in there, but we can do a little bit of work to just change them. Now the noise type, turbulence is fine. You can use wavy turbulence if you wish, but I think just leave it at the turbulence. I think that's perfectly good, but it is entirely up to you. You're the art director, but we'll leave that as turbulence. The noise scene and everything else here, the, the noise strength, we'll leave those as they are and the octaves. And the global scale here can remain at 1000%. That's perfectly good for us. The relative scale, we'll make this 102. OK, and that's just smoothed things out a little bit there. And we can make this 134. I found that was a good sweet spot for the Z scale. So we'll leave 134 in there. And it just it just makes the stones a little bit irregular. And we can also do some more work if we wish. If that was just a little bit too irregular for you, you can use the low clip. You can just adjust that if you wish, and it will change things again. Uh, it makes the stones alter their shape very, very slightly. I mean, we can put a little bit of that in maybe, maybe about 10 if we use that. That looks pretty good to me. I mean, they aren't regular shapes, but they're not ridiculously irregular either if we look at them from above. I mean, so F2, just to go into our top view. We can see that we've got some nice irregular shapes, but they're not overly irregular. That's the kind of look I think I'm going for. But uh, as I say, entirely up to you to art direct this in any way you choose. But that about completes this step. So I think we can move on from here. So the next step then is to start coding. What we can do first is bring in the Python effector and the Voronoi fracture is selected. So we can see straight away that the effector has been assigned to the Voronoi fracture. If we come to our effectors here, we can see it's there. Let's start work with this. We want in our effector tab here, we want full control as opposed to parameter control. We'll then switch to a scripting layout, open in the editor and we're ready to start work. We'll take away the loop for a start. We don't want that. Execute and bring the path back to where it originally was. OK, so what do we need to add in? Well, let's start adding some variables. For a start up here, we can say far because we want the flag array that will allow us to make the path invisible and visible or the paving stones invisible and visible. And we can copy this piece of code here, paste in here and then start doing a little bit of work with this. And we simply need to take this away and put flags in there. So that's created our flag array or initialized our flag array. And down here we can copy this piece of code and we can just paste it in there. Move that back and we can start doing a little bit of work here. So we just need to say flags and where we've got ma, just take that away and put far in there. So that will make sure that everything is updated. Fantastic. So moving on from here, then the next thing to really define is the frame variable, the ubiquitous frame variable. We just put a bracket on the end there as well so that we don't get a syntax error. So frame is equal to doc dot get time dot get frame brackets doc dot get FPS open double close and for anybody who doesn't know and I hope you will know by now this just enables us to get the current frame from the timeline fantastic so we've got that far moving on from here we don't need to concern ourselves with these two lines we can just leave those alone I'll now define my global variables so I'm going to say global we only need a few and for a start we know that the path will initially be invisible. There'll be nothing visible at all. None of the paving stones will be on the screen. So it makes sense to define an invisible variable, which will ultimately be a list. Now, as the path appears, obviously the stones need to be made visible. So we'll define visible as well. We then need clone. We need trigger. And we need start time clone I mean we could we're not using clones here but we we can still use this uh, this variable or we could simply say stones or stone 
for paving stone. It's entirely up to you. Let's leave it as stone. That's our global variables defined. Moving on from here, we need to add some user data to our Python effector, and that will be our next step. So we've got our Python effector selected, and we can come into our user data here and add user data. The first data I'm going to add will be called man. It will be a link, and that's as much as we need to do there, and we'll ultimately be dragging our character into there. So that's our first user data defined. We can now add data, and here we'll call this spline, and just give it a capital just to make things tidy. And this will be a spline type. So let's go down here and select spline. We won't worry about this for the moment. That's all good. I'll also add a group as per usual, remove it from the user data, put my man and my spline both in there and just call this controls. They're not really controls, but we'll call them controls. And then we can just hit OK, and we've got it here, and it's all set up, ready for us. Now I said that we will drag our character into the link field, so we'll do that. And then we can define things here. So let's do that. If we say man is equal to, and we drag this in, we can put up in front of our brackets there, and that's ready to go. And then we can simply add our spline. So we can say spline is equal to, and drag this in, place it there. And that will be equals to op user data three. So they're both ready to go. Now what I'll do in here is just command click to add a point, command click to add a second point, and we'll leave it like that. It can be a, a, a an S curve, basically, an ease out, easing curve. One thing I may do, though, is work with the tangents. Let's just make this minus 0.25 and then do the same with this one, make this 0.25. In fact, it already is, so we can just leave that alone. Great, so those are set up and they're ready to go. Moving on from here, we can think about working on the main body of what we're actually doing. But there's one more variable that we'll define. We'll actually define pos. And that's going to be is equal to man dot get absolute position. So what we're interested in here is getting the absolute position of the man within our scene. That's what we're going to be using. And we'll use that a little bit later. Fantastic. So we've got it that far. And the next thing we can think about is initializing everything at frame zero. So. We can say if frame is equal to zero, and then we can start work. Invisible is equal to an empty list. Visible, once again, is equal to an empty list. Stone is equal to an empty list. Trigger. Can you guess what it's going to be? Is equal to an empty list. And finally, start time is equal to an empty list. We can then say for i in range with a space between the two words, and it will be CNT because we want the count value. So we want the number of stones. So for I in range count, and it will be invisible dot append brackets I. So we're going to take all of our stones and place them in this invisible list. OK, that's the first thing that we're going to do. And that's all we need to do at frame zero. That initializes everything. The next thing we need to do is worry about defining the one function that we're going to require in order to make the whole thing hang together. And that's what we're going to start on next.
So we'll come back up to here and just put a bit of a space there. And we can say def and it will be magic underscore path open close colon. So this will be our function. Now the first thing that we need to do is actually check to see whether or not we've actually got any stones in our visible list. That's the first thing that we need to do. Okay. Don't worry about this error. That's not a problem. It's, it's not a problem at all. It might be because I've got a spelling mistake. If I have, let's have a quick look. In this, yes, I have. I've got a spelling mistake there. That's it. That should fix that. Okay, let's move on from here. So in our function here, we can say if len brackets visible is greater than zero. And from here we can do this. So we can say for i in range and it will be len brackets visible and we can then define our x, y and z coordinates. So it will be x is equal to and it will be ma brackets visible brackets i double close dot off dot x i'll put all of this in and then we'll go through it so y will equal zero z will equal and i'm going to copy this piece of code for this paste it in here and say off dot z to finish this off i can simply say ma open brackets and it will be visible brackets i double close dot off is equal to c4d dot vector and it will be brackets x comma y comma z so here we're simply if we've got anything in our visible list i mean initially we won't have so everything will be invisible but once we actually get something in there what we're going to do is basically say let's check all of the stones that are currently in this list and we'll get their current position x values their y value will need to be zero because they will have risen into place and then need to be fixed at position zero along the y axis and we will also require their current z positions okay so we're looking at their position x their position z and we're fixing their position y at zero we can then say that our current stone which we're going to be using here because of course we're going through the for loop and the for loop may only be one element in length initially but it can be up to 18 or 19. so we'll take the current stone and we'll set its position its absolute position to a vector containing the values stored in x y and z and that will fix it in its position it will fix it actually where you see it now OK, so that's what we're going, to, we're going to be doing here. So that's the first part of this done. Moving on from here, we can worry about the rest of the body of this function. So once again, we can say. For I in range. And it will be len brackets invisible. double close and then we can start thinking about what we're doing in here so we can say if i is in invisible oops we don't want that bracket we can say far brackets i and it will be and equals so ampersand equals 
and then our squiggly little line which we've got down at the bottom of our keyboard brackets c4d dot and it will be mogen just make sure we spell that correctly mogen flag underscore clone underscore on so what we're using here is a bitwise function it's basically a not and that's what we're saying here this is and and this squiggly little line means not so not and and it allows us to basically switch clones off the the clones here will be switched off whereas these clones here will be invisible they're going to be or they're going to be invisible <laughs> as in in the visible list not invisible um, so those what these are the clones that we want switched on the clones in here we want switched off okay that's what we're doing so we can then say diff underscore vect is equal to and it will be ma square brackets i dot off that side of the brackets minus pause so we're getting the position of each stone and we're subtracting it from the position of our man that's what we're doing there that creates a difference vector which is why we've got defect there the next thing to do is create a distance vector so we can say dist underscore vect and it will be is equal to and it will be diff underscore vect dot get length open close and that will create the actual distance vector so that will be the distance between the center of our stone and our man's current position that's what we're getting there and that's going to be useful to us because we're going to be using that to switch the stones on so moving on from here then we can say if dist underscore vect is less than or equal to and we've got to define a value well I played around with it and the sweet spot I found was 80 so if the length of our distance vector so from at the, this the point of, of where our man is here to the center of this if it's less than or equal to 80 then this condition will be satisfied so from here we can take the next step and we can now say if len visible is less than or equal to and we'll say 18. now let's just take a look at our voronoi fracture here and if we go into our transform tab here and in the display if we display index we can see that we're going from naught to 19. so we've got 20 stones okay but we we're not we're saying less than or equal to 18. I'm not going to be using this initial stone. OK, I want this stone to remain invisible because if you look at it, it's only about half the length. Well, in fact, it is half the length of all the other stones and that will present us with a problem. So I don't want this stone to be made visible. So. If the length of visible is less than or equal to 18, what we can then say. Is visible dot append and it will be i so we want to append the current stones value or index value to our visible list the next thing we want to do is remove that current stone from the invisible list so we can now say invisible dot pop to remove the actual stone and brackets I because we want that current stone to be removed so that sorts that out okay moving on from here another if statement so we can say if len and it will be brackets stone 
So if len stone is less than one, and it will be stone dot append, and it will be brackets i. So we just we just want one stone at a time. That's all we're interested in. So as long as we've got nothing in our stone list, and initially, of course, we won't because it's an empty list. So if there's nothing in there, we can append the, the index value of the current stone. That's what we're doing there. We can then say if len trigger, and that will be less than one because again, we don't want this list to exceed one element in length. We can say trigger dot append. And as I always put in there, just one. It can be any value. You could put a thousand in there, but it, one is fine. So that's done. And then we can worry about start time. So if len brackets start time, again, less than one. Start time dot append, oops, not quite, dot append, and it will be brackets frame. So we want the current value that's stored in our frame variable that we defined up here. OK, so that completes the necessary if statements that we need to get things working thus far. The next thing to do is come back to this level here, and we can say, if len brackets trigger is equal to one. So if there's something in trigger, we want something to happen. And this is the point at which we want our stone to appear and then rise into position. OK, so that's what we're about next. And this is where we need a monoflop and we also need a range mapper. So we can say duration is equal to and it will be frame and you've probably seen me do this before because it's the same formula and it will be minus start underscore time brackets zero so whatever frame value we've got stored in our start time we're going to subtract from the current frame value along the timeline here thereby giving us a starting point of zero followed by one two three etc we can then say if duration and I'm going to say less than 10 because I want this to happen over 10 frames. So if duration is less than 10, we can then say range underscore mapper is equal to C4D dot utils for utilities because that's where the range mapper is stored. Range map. So that's what the range mapper is. That's what we're getting from the utilities. We're getting the range mapper. And it will be duration. So our duration value will be coming in as our first variable there. We're ranging from 0 to 10. That's our input range. And this is exactly the same type of range mapper as you'll find in Expresso, just in code. We can then say that we want our stones to start from minus 10. OK, that's going to be their starting position. So they're going to end up at zero, but they're going to start at minus 10 and rise to zero. And then it will be comma zero, comma false, comma spline. So our output range will be minus 10 to zero. We've just said that. And we've got a false in there because we're working with a minus value. So if we were working with positive values, we can put true in there, but we're not. We're working with a minus value to zero. And of course, spline refers to the spline that we've got up here, the spline that we actually defined here. That's what's going to be pulled in there. OK, fantastic. So that's all done. The next step is to say x is equal to, and it basically is going to be this code. So we can copy all of this, actually. If we copy these three, Let's just remove that from there, just paste that in there. We can then space these in and then we can do a little bit more work. So in here we need to say stone and it will be stone brackets zero. The same thing will apply down here, but before we get there, we'll make this range 
underscore mapper because we want the stones to rise so we need the value that's coming out of the range mapper once again stone brackets zero so those are ready and then we can copy this line again here paste this in and once again we can say stone bracket zero and that gets that stage fixed and sorted out we can then come back one level to here type else it does help if you spell it correctly and then it's a simple case of clone dot clear and if you're using an early version of cinema 4d i will put the equivalent that you will need to use on the screen trigger dot clear and finally start underscore time dot clear and that resets everything ready for the next cycle okay to finish this off completely we just need one more line of code and that needs to go here and that is simply magic underscore path open close to call this function okay so we've got to the moment of truth because that completes the code that's as much as you need to do to make this work so let's click on this and see if we've got any problems okay so in line 76 we do have an issue let's have a quick look see what we've got clone of course it should be stone stone not clone now let's see if we've got an issue and straight away we can see that we fix things our path has disappeared that's exactly what should happen at frame zero because we put all of our clones or all of our stones into invisible and of course because we've called magic path the first thing we've done is cleared them here this this has been looked at but it's been ignored at this current moment in time so we're looking at what's going on in here and this is making all of our stones disappear okay then so let's run the timeline and see if anything actually works right so we've got another problem let's have a look it's reference, reference before okay variable invisible is reference before assignment in enclosing scope so that's line 40 let's see where we are in here let's have a look let's just do a little bit of checking right let's have a quick check let's check the globals because I don't believe the problem is actually here it can't be in fact because it wouldn't work at frame zero if it was so there's something going on up here let's have a look ah okay okay it thinks it's a free variable because this is spelled incorrectly so it should be invisible that should be right so let's have a quick check see if that does what it's supposed to do so play right there's another problem ah, okay so the name visible is not defined let's have a look visible where are we line 32 line 32 visible is definitely spelled correctly there let's have a look at line 32 what have we got visible looks as if it's right to me let's have a look see what we've got len visible have we got anything else spelt wrong can't see anything else spelt wrong down there yeah there's something else i think it's, it could be that there's something else causing that problem Let's just take this back to zero and run this again. Where are we? Ah, it's not that actually. Local variable range mapper is referenced before assignment. Local variable range mapper, where are we? Line 69. Let's have a look, see where we are. Something's not been. Let's have a look. Range mapper. Range mapper is. Oh, I see. I can see what the problem is. They need to be tabbed in one more level. Let's go back and see what we've got now. Well, we got one stone rising. Um, local variable range mapper reference. Let's see, what's 69? Where are we? Range mapper is equal to. Ah, I think I see what it is. The else and these, they also need to be tabbed in. Yeah, they've got to be level with the, the if else. This is the if else here. So that hopefully has improved things let's see what happens now 
no we still he still thinks local variable range map or assign bef reference before assignment why is that why is that very very strange I mean it's assigned here and then it's referenced here very very odd right in the edit I have fixed this problem all I did was do a delete there so I moved the range mapper line here back one level and then I tabbed it back in and that if we go back to zero and play has solved the issue but we've still got another issue as you can see we're only getting that first uh, paving slab rising up so why might that be well it transpires that this character shouldn't be in this motion offset here now when I did my original magic path effector which is this file here if we go into our Python and open this up just so that we've got the same code that we got and we can see that everything is exactly the same now what we've got if we look at our character I've still got my male puppet character here with my character in it my Voronoi fracture is up here and my walking loop is here and my motion offset so I haven't got my character in the motion offset and yet everything is working fine if we can see that it works perfectly well can't we however if we switch back to our, my tutorial file here open my Python up again in the editor so that we've got the code visible now we can see that I've got my character male puppet character here my character is in the motion offset which is making him walk correctly but it's not making the paving stones rise up now you would think then that I could move this up here and now we get the right result but we still don't so something very quirky is going on here I would have expected that to work it should because it's now set up the same way as it is in here we can see that the area male puppet character character is in there and our motion offset is there with just the walking loop in it which is what we've got there if we open this we've got the mocap hips more mocap rig with the hips and everything else in there too so that's the way it's set up in my original file but it still doesn't work here so there's something weird and really weird going on here I mean it's it's not even bringing the first stone up now so what do we need to do well I found that all we need to do is drop the character there and let's see what happens now and straight away it works <laughs> I mean answers on a postcard I don't know what's going on there that's something very very strange indeed but as you can see it's now working perfectly and I'll be very interested to know if you're getting a similar problem to this you know when you set your thing up here do you get a similar problem because it's very very interesting that that's gone on there and I've got no explanation for it it could be a bug it could just be a, a ghost in the machine thing again you know it's just a little quirk that's happened I just don't know what it is but as you can see everything is working really nicely now and our character is walking along the path and the stones are rising up to meet his footsteps as I've always planned they should do right so let's just close down the scripting layout and return to the standard layout and we'll just take a, a bit of a look at this and perhaps set up a an interesting camera angle and then we can see things moving through we'll also go into the Voronoi fracture into the transform and select none so that we don't see the stones index values and there we go we can see it working really nicely but yeah so we can imagine that this is a, a pathway over a river perhaps um, you know there could be land here and land over here that he's walking towards and there could be a river flowing by and these are rising up out of the river maybe you know or it could be a pathway through an enchanted forest and you could have flowers growing up on either side of the path as he walks along you know there's so many ways you could do interesting things with this really and it might be the sort of thing that would look interesting perhaps in a music video or you know maybe even a feature film a sort of fantasy feature film I don't know but plenty of possibilities with something like this but I'll leave you to have a think about what you might do anyway there is one last thing I want to show you before we finally finish the tutorial now if we just stop the timeline and we switch to our right hand view if we take a look 
at our character's feet. Now, let's just if we look carefully, we can see that his foot is actually inside the stone. It's actually inside the stone. This one here is rising up, but this is in place. And we can see his shoe is, is just slightly inside the stone. Now, what we need to do is make a little bit of an adjustment in the Python. So let's just go back to the scripting layout for a minute and we'll select the Python edit, uh, the, the Python effector and go into the editor. Now, where we've got y is equal to zero and in our range mapper, we're going from minus 10 to zero. We just need to adjust these and I found minus one was pretty good. We could do minus two, but minus one, I think works very well. So that should fix that problem. Let's just play through. And now the stones are not rising quite as high. So let's just get him to here, just to our last stone. And it should be in place there. Yeah, he's in place now. Let's just zoom in a little bit closer on him and just see where his foot is. And I think we can see, yeah, he's not going through the stone there. The sole of his shoe is on the top of the stone. That's important. So, you know, make sure you just set that up accurately if, if that were to happen. So, you know, you can't use zero on this occasion. It, it has to be minus one. OK, let's just go F3 h let's just have a quick look and we should find we're okay yeah we're okay there i mean it is it might even be that it's still fractionally through but to be perfectly honest you're never going to notice that and that's fine i think we can leave it like that i mean if you want to be really pedantic about it you can of course play around with the numbers some more and, and say you know minus one point four or whatever you know you can play around to your heart's content but for my purposes here that's fine it's just important to show you that so that you're aware of it really but anyway that just about brings us to the end of this tutorial so as always i really hope you've enjoyed doing this one and that it's been fun for you uh, and that you've got a lot out of it and got some ideas and inspiration for things that you can perhaps use in your own projects and if you have enjoyed the video, then as always, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and of course, ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, then please, please do share this video because all this good stuff really does help keep the channel moving in the right direction. But anyway, for now, that just about brings the curtain down on this one. So I'll see you very soon on the next tutorial.